My opening statement, I decided, if I didn't know what to say, was this. Thank you for the Academy Award. I, I have forgotten my speech. <laughs> so, a few years ago, actually whenever we watch the Academy Awards, I think, you know, they never really give out trophies to artists. There's other people that don't get trophies either, like waitresses and other people. But um, skipping ahead, I decided to make some trophy dolls. And, and, and they are on the left of the striped dolls here, with the, with, the eye, with the bone thing coming up. And they were meant to give to your wife, your mother, your sister, anybody who has dedicated their life to something and will never get acknowledged for it. So I call them trophy dolls. And after, after I had made them, they were made in conjunction with um, Hi Jim, with, um, if I say your name, wave your arm. Because basically, I want everybody here to meet each other. And I'm not gonna have time afterwards to introduce who I want to meet to each other. So if I say who you are, it's like everybody here is somebody that each of you should meet. So, um, the trophy dolls were made in conjunction with Pacific Standard Time, which was a Getty initiative. And the Craft and Folk Art Museum showed the Georgie girl, which is the chair, back there. And they asked if I would be willing to make some small dolls for them in conjunction with that. So that's what the trophy dolls started out as, were a small group that I made for that. For that. Um, I think before I do anything else, I really want to acknowledge Gregory. Raise your hand. <laughs> um, Gregory and I are both people who have our own path, and we do our own thing, and we're totally committed to what we do. And that's what I love about him. Um, you know, I'm used to him working Thanksgivings and Christmases and New Year's for doing fashion ads for department stores. And he's used to me working all hours and not coming home until late. And um, we've been together since 1966. And um, we didn't get married until 73 because we wanted to be for sure, for sure. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And what we did was we committed to 600 years with a 600 year option. <laughs> and, and in the wedding vows, he said to me, I will support you being whoever you want to be and doing whatever you do. <laughs> and I want to thank you <laughs> for that commitment <laughs> because he's never ever not done that. And so, um, <laughs> While we, while we don't work together, and we're constantly, he's a fashion illustrator and an entertainment illustrator, we're constantly uncovering works of his that I have never seen before, ever. Because he worked over there and I worked over here and we were both busy. So anyway, thank you Gregory for, for this. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm living the life I wanted to live and, and Years ago, I, I had an epiphany that I had come here to play, and that I had come here, meaning in this manifestation, um, to have fun. And that I really didn't want to deal with the mundane things of life. And those things really distract me. And we don't have kids, and so I have no frame of reference as to what year I did anything. <laughs> I don't. That's not anything that's important to me, to remember facts and details. If you want me to be more specific, shout out. Can you hand me my, my notepad? I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about, and it's not going to be linear. <laughs> I'm going to talk about early influences. I'm going to talk about fashion versus wood. I'm going to talk about process in the wood shop and in my life. I'm going to talk about my vision for the future. Are you kidding me? Woo! <laughs> I'll enter, oh my God, oh my God. This guy and I went to college together, Michael Nicola. Oh my God, Gabriel, oh my God, oh my God. 
Oh, my God. Um, uh, no, that's OK. Um, the whole thing about process is, is that I, it's like, Richard Taylor, raise your hand. We met in the eighth grade in Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> and, and I was Mary Tyler Moore to his Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> and uh, we both left Anchorage, and he went to Ohio, and we went to Nevada. And then we ended up here. And Richard ended up meeting his fabulous wife, and I ended up meeting Gregory. And, but we have remained friends. And, you know, for half my life I've had Porsche 911s, and Richard taught me how to drive a stick shift <laughs> in Indiana, <laughs> right when we were in high school. And, like, some things stick, like how to drive a stick shift, like how to not brake, like how to downshift, like how to do a curve. And, like, every time I drove those cars, I would think of you. So what I'm trying to do is connect the people in my life and the things in my life that have given me just out-of-body experiences with the experience of being in the wood shop and working in wood and doing, and doing this thing that I never thought, uh, th 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 there was never anything I was going to do. I was going to be a fashion designer. Michael and I took theater classes together where we designed movie clothes, you know? A thing with you, sitting in your car outside of Cal State Northridge to Sonny and Cher singing, I've Got You, Babe, <laughs> cranked up to as loud as you can do it, and having it be like, a, like again, an out-of-body experience, right? <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> so I wanted to be a clothing designer, and I wanted to go to Parsons, and early on, when I was 11, my mother got a singer sewing machine. And we got free classes. They were on a Wednesday night opposite a show called The Millionaire. And I really wanted to stay home and watch The Millionaire. <laughs> but we had to go to these sewing classes. <laughs> and there was a competition to make a dress. C can you find a little picture? So I entered this competition and I won first prize Singer Junior Sewing Contest, 1955. And you can see Gregory cuts his beard and I cut the dog's faces with, with the missing pair. But you can see how I used these scissors. Um, how sewing relates to wood to me is that when you buy fabric, you tend to never buy enough. And when you go to lay it out, you go, ah, I don't have room for this facing. How am I going to arrange? When you buy lumber, hi, Darren. When you buy lumber, <coughs> um, the board is maybe 8 feet long or 12 feet long or whatever. And the next board that you bought at the same time from the same place may have a different grain. So you have this limited material that, that, that that you don't just go in and cut. Like, like, like the two books we're going to talk about, one is called The War of Art. Not the art of war, but the war of art. <laughs> and the other one is, and I don't remember who wrote that, but David Lynch wrote the other one called Catching the Big Fish. And he quotes a friend of his, hi Sandy, and he says, um, if you have to go into the studio to write, and you have an hour's worth of writing to do, you need four hours. <laughs> because you have to focus, and you have to pay attention. And some of this I learned when I started teaching these little make-a-heart classes in Venice in the studio. Um, with it takes an hour to figure out which direction you're going to put the heart on the grain of wood. You know, which side, which direction? Is it going to go this way or that way? And then to draw it out precise. I'm not going to give you an illustration cutout where you go like this and your heart's done. No, I'm going to give you this precision square, these pencils that are so sharp. Emily said to me, how did you get those lines on there? <coughs> with a sharp pencil, with a really sharp pencil. 
I only recently discovered that if I'm cutting a black piece of wood, like black wood or wingy, guess what? You can really see a white pencil on that better <laughs> than trying to get the light to hit your lead on a regular size, on a regular pencil. And these are the kinds of little things that ring my bell, that like move me forward, where you see something that you haven't seen before, or where something comes together in a way that you're like, how did that happen? You know, that these things have lined up. Um, I want to show you the stool, too. Oh, that's not a good no. Also in 1955, when I was doing this singer sewing thing, my father said to me, why don't you come out in the garage and we'll make something. So this is also 1955, <laughs> and this is my first little red stool <laughs> that I made. And you'll see, I had a car. There used to be a thing in magazines called Draw Me. I thought I could draw that and maybe become an artist. I was in love with a boy named James <laughs> who played baseball, baseball, baseball. James is up here. Um, <laughs> so my parents were in the military. And we moved around, and we ended up at Cal State Northridge. They said, you're going to school closest to home. And I decided to major in craft. And it was ceramics, and wood, and jewelry, and weaving. So I picked ceramics. But I also went into photography. And then I had this really cute teacher that reminded me of, a counselor that reminded me of Steve McQueen. And one day we were having a meeting and he said, why don't you come in the wood shop and get covered in sawdust? Um, you're covered in clay. My mother had said, you have to take typing, you know, you need something to fall back on. So I would go to typing across campus with clay all over me and sit there with all these girls dressed up and I would have clay all over me. So Ralph Evans says, why don't you come and get covered with sawdust? And the first thing we did was go on a field trip down to Rare Woods, down in the middle of, of LA, Bandini and, and, and Soto Streets. And I had one of those experiences where the hair on my arm stood up on, you know, and I fell in love with this old guy that had this place called Rare Woods, Louis Rigglesberger. And I have this way of, if I love someplace, I sort of just go, it's mine. So people used to think I was his granddaughter because when I was there, it was my place and I would help other people do things, you know? And he had big, big, big machines and he had, he had pictures of him in Africa and South America with natives. Um, but it just took a hold of me and I couldn't let go. So I go into the wood shop and the first assignment is make a doll or a toy laminating different colors of exotic hardwoods. And so I had done these little drawings for fashion design and the doll over there, um, Tanya, point to the doll right there. <laughs> That's the first little doll I ever made. And um, uh, the next one I made for my sister so my parents would buy me some more wood. And then the next group is another assignment called make a pull apart or a movable toy. So I decided I would do these three dimensional uh, paper dolls where the heads were interchangeable and the bodies. And then the next semester we had to make a piece of furniture. And all the guys said, oh, we're gonna make stereos. <laughs> and all the women who had come in second semester to turn a salad bowl set said, we're going back to ceramics. <laughs> <laughs> so there I was wondering what I was gonna make. And I had this really cool photography instructor, Don Chipperfield. And I was having coffee, not that I drink coffee, but he was having coffee. And I, he said, what are you gonna do next in wood? And I said, I have no idea. I have to make like a piece of furniture. And he was like, you know those dolls you make, why don't you make like, like a life-size one? And I was like, <laughs> you know, like when you hear it, when you hear it and it's it, you know it if you're paying attention, right? So I'm like, okay. Now, it's not gonna be solid because it's going to be one, too heavy, 
cost too much for my parents, so it's going to be hollow. Plus, it's a piece of furniture, right? Then if it's hollow, it's going to be wasted space standing there in the middle of the room if I don't make some drawers in it <laughs> or make a hidden compartment or make something that opens. So that was really my whole thought process on how these things sort of came about. Then the next semester, we were supposed to make a chair. And I was like, how? OK, how am I going to make a chair? So the pull-apart dolls came apart. And next to Daniela, could you point to the one that's sitting? <laughs> yes, she's actually not glued down. Yeah, she comes apart, right? So I pulled her apart, and I set her on this little block of wood that's been there for 50 years, and pulled her apart, and there was the chair, like that easy. And then it was just like, oh, OK. You know, 10 inches wide, 10 inches deep, make the drawers. That was that. Then, so I'm still doing ceramics and, and wood. And I had made the ceramic dolls that are behind Kobe, Richard Taylor's daughter, <laughs> yes. And uh, I, had, I had gone to, I had pulled out like a fashion book of the history of fashion. And I thought, oh, OK, I'll, I'll like do some history of fashion in clay. And then we had to do a slab project. So I'm rolling out this slab, and I decided to make a horse. And I don't remember why. I don't remember why. But a few, oh, shortly thereafter, I was in the library at Cal State Northridge, and this book fell out in front of me in the aisle. And it was a Haniwa Japanese tomb sculpture, prehistory Japan. And there was a picture of my horse. <laughs> and I had never seen it before that I knew of, right? And also, back in, we, we all had to take art history. Well, I would sit there and I would look at the cave paintings, the cave drawings, and I would look at the spears and the utensils, and they all had like animals carved on the ends of them. And, and I started going, whoa. Everything is functional, but it also is sculpture in prehistoric times. That's my thing. It's like, that's my thing. That's what I'm going to do. And then at some point, Life Magazine did this big issue called Fantasy Furniture. And I thought, that's what I do. It was the Lalanes with the sheep and the big rhino bars. It was Pedro Friedeberg, the guy that does the hands like this. He's still alive that you can sit in. Tommy Simpson did painted fantastical furniture. And I thought, like, you know, like the ugly duckling. I'm like, I found my flock. <laughs> I do fantasy functional sculpture. So around that time, well, I had also, the, the way I met Gregory was, I had entered a competition with Mademoiselle Magazine. And I had been chosen as 20 college girls that would go to New York and live at the Barbizon Hotel, and work on Madison Avenue at Condé Nast. And basically, I was living my dream as a sophomore. But they said, you're a sophomore. You have to go back and finish your school. And then we'll hire you. So then I came back and started working at Bullock's, at Bullock's where I met Gregory. Um, but somehow, one day, Eudora Moore showed up in, in the hallway at Cal State Northridge. And Eudora was this bigger-than-life woman who could move mountains to support craft. And she did this thing in Pasadena called um, California Design. And she said, I want your chairs in California Design. Please bring them out. So I had these two Georgie girls that I took out there. Right there. What? Oh, on the cover of the phone. So, so what happened was, they put my dolls and me on the cover of Home Magazine. <laughs> and I was also, because of my connection with Bullocks and knowing some models, and there was an opening for a designer in Torrance, I was also designing clothes and driving from Torrance to Cal State Northridge at night to work on things. And so the same month, which is like April of 1968, I had a dress on the cover of Seventeen Magazine that was 100% my dress and this picture on Home Magazine. 
And Denise, whom I was working for, said to me, you have got to make a choice. She said, I want, when you look at a telephone pole, I want you to see Denise dresses. And I'm thinking, when I look at a telephone pole, I see wooden dolls. <laughs> so long, Denise. <laughs> so from, from this publicity that started from doll number one and continued this whole time for 20 years nonstop with this local support from Beth Ann Creer at the LA Times and Charles Bush, who were became good friends and would do articles on me. It, it's like it wasn't now where there's like a gazillion 20-year-olds all doing something, <laughs> you know? It was like I was that girl woodworker. Um, so I got a phone call at my mother's house, of all places, back before anything, right? Cell phones or anything. I didn't know how this, she says, it's for you. His name was Charles Kratka and he was an architect. And he said, would you be interested in doing a sculpture for the center lobby of a savings and loan. And I said, no. <laughs> no. What's, what's your name and phone number? I'm putting the phone down and I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, right? I hang up the phone, call him back, and say, okay, let's talk. So I had my first architectural commission, which was, again, for the lobby of a savings and loan in Santa Ana. And, I, and it was supposed to be for the mother-in-law to sit on while the wife was doing the banking, for the children to play on, and for the other people to admire. So I did a seated woman, a seated mother, a standing father, and I researched the size of lapels, and I did a pinstripe shirt, and I put a pocket handkerchief in his pocket, and the mother had a skirt that went out to the front and out to the back, and then a right angle bench. I just thought it was so cool, right? And then I did a little girl this tall, so that if a child came in, a little girl, she could walk right up to the sculpture, and there she was, right? And then, sexist I guess, for the boys, <laughs> I made a dog. <laughs> dog on the floor and his head turned. So you could sit on the dog on the floor and you could go da 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 Okay? So that was the first commission. Then I get a call, Orbux. We're doing the children's shoe department. We want something for the wall so that the children can stand up on the banquette and play with things. Do you do animals? I'm thinking, well, I did a horse and I did a dog. Yes, I do animals, <laughs> yes. So they wanted 13, we ended up doing 13 animals. This is one of them. Gregory was driving by Orbox as it was being demolished and thought, I wonder if any of Pamela's things are in there. The camel was there. You can see where he's been broken. Uh, he was broken on the neck, he was broken across here. Um, he was in the wood shop for decades, I didn't know how to fix him. He was just junk. Then I got this amazing guy that works with me on Saturdays called Martine, and between the two of us, we can do anything, which is so cool. So, a side note, I heard a lecture by Adrian Sachs one time at LACMA. Uh, ceramic guy, really cool ceramic guy. And he said, you know, I tie all these things on my vessels, and I want my collectors to add to it, but nobody ever will. So I think if you're the artist, you can change things. It's not like Antiques Roadshow where they say don't touch it. It's like I'm still alive, the camel needs to be repaired. Martine and I have him on the table and we set him down and I'm like, dude, this is tall. This is like really cool. Like, what if we put him on wheels? You could dance with him, <laughs> right? And then, what if he wasn't flat against the wall? We'll, we'll put the hump in the middle of the camel instead of to the front with the, with the flush back, right? And then, before we glued the hump back to here, I realized I could hang fabulous tapestries across here. 
So he's not glued back yet, because I haven't, the final vote is not in <laughs> as to whether or not he should be like this or have, because I have a fabulous textile collection, whether it should be like a room divider, right? So part of my fun now is being present in the moment and working on things that have been unfinished, some of them for 40 years. Because as I would get commissions, what happened was I would get an architectural commission and I would develop something and then someone would say, so the animals at Orbux were the camel, the buffalo, the rhino, the elephants, the lamb, the lion, two lions. So when another architect called about a shopping center and they were like, could you do a playground for children in the middle of an indoor shopping center? And I thought, where, I said, where is it? And they said, Santa Anita. And I'm like, oh, what's Santa Anita? Racetrack, right? Horses, obvious. Why don't I take the 13 Orbox animals that are this thick and make them, th make them thick and do those as the racing animals? So every animal had like a saddle blanket with a number on it, one through eight. And then there was Anita who had her name uh, laminated across her chest. She was number eight. <laughs> so I've done three indoor playgrounds, and each of them, the theme is animals and a child, which is basically, can you give me the pin? Which is basically the love between humans and pets. And I have to acknowledge my dogs. It seems that the tech people that come and work with me never like dogs. <laughs> and one of them even suggested I post less of them on Instagram. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't understand. Woodworking is like the loneliness of the long distance runner. I am alone all day. These dogs are animated to me. They are my friends. The the brother and sister I have now, Panda, oh, she's like, oh my God, I love everything you make. <laughs> <laughs> she says, and I love watching you make it. <laughs> and Teddy goes and barks at the front door <laughs> and keeps us safe. So um, I think Emily was even in the room when this happened. Um, we were looking at Mabel and her tiger, which is in the window. And I had just found, we were looking, it's like when you're gonna have a retrospective, you think, how did I get here? And what were my influences? And what happened? Well, this pin was given to me when I was four years old in Anchorage, Alaska, by my, by my, my parents' friends, Arnold Podalski. Arnold was my parents' best friend, just like Danielle is our best friend, right? So Arnold came over and gave me this pin. And it's a girl and her dog. So, like, a girl and her dog have been my theme, you know? There. <laughs> um, I know there's lots more to talk about, and I can literally go for two hours at the studio when somebody comes who's never been there before. It's two hours. So, do you guys want to stop me right here and ask any questions or have any comments or... Shall I just ramble on? <laughs> I want to introduce this guy. He came in, his name is Richard Rosen. We communicated a few years ago. He taught woodworking at Lompoc High School? High School, yeah, close to it. Cabrillo High School in Vandenberg, Vandenberg Airport. So there was a film made on me in 1970-ish. He showed that film to his class every semester for how many years? Uh, 10 years. For it, was, it was five projects a day. Five. <laughs> so he knows the entire film. He can recite the entire film. And he has come today to ask me some questions. He said he has a million, and I said, well, give me one. Well, I, I was uh, looking forward to you saying something about the circus. Well, the playgrounds were an amazing experience. Santa Anita, I literally just did the Orbox animals and developed them further. Then the next one was in Modesto. 
So I drove up to Modesto with my dog, Glory, and I said, what's here? Dairy farms, pig farms, and goat farms. I was really into pigs. They were really cute, but they were kind of all alike. The goats had these amazing eyes that were yellow with a black line through them. They were fabulous. The cows were black and white dairy cows. And the dairyman gave me permission, I don't know why, to go out in hundreds of dairy cows in the middle of the night with a full moon <laughs> where I took pictures going, I can't believe I'm here <laughs> alone with all these cows and I hope I'm safe. So I'm driving on Blue Gum Road and I think, Modesto, cows, moo, moo desto. <laughs> done, 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 done. So cows were the second one. Then Thousand Oaks is the next one. They go, hello, we have a playground we'd like for you to do in Thousand Oaks. I go, what's there? They say, we don't know. I go out. There is a little architect architect's uh, camper in the middle of nowhere. And I go, what's here? And he says, there used to be a place called Jungle Land. And the old folks that ran it are still there. You can go see them. So I drive out to this place that used to be called Jungle Land, and I remembered Jane Mansfield's son got mauled at Jungle Land, and it got closed down. I remembered that from the newspaper previously. So I go out there to this old couple's home, and there are stacks of press with animal trails through all of their press. And I thought, if I'm not careful, this will be me, which it is, <laughs> which it is. <laughs> How am I ever going to find something here? So they bring me a box, I sit down on the floor, and right out of the bat, I don't think we have that picture. There's a woman tiger tamer named Mabel Stark. And she was the first tiger tamer. She wrote some little books. Leslie Zemeckis has a documentary out on her right now. Uh, Kate Winslet optioned the rights a few years ago. She was a pretty outrageous woman in a man's world. She got seduced by tigers the way I got seduced by wood. And there was a photograph, a black and white glossy photograph of her. She taught tigers to waltz. This was a jaguar in the picture, but it, so the playground became Mabel Stark and her cats. And Emily, earlier said something about triangles and blocks, and I said, no, 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 triangles didn't come till later. Triangles and diagonals came with the cows. With, with, the, th with the Thousand Oaks Circus, Stephanie Deland, she was my studio mate for years in Venice, she does porcelain, and she would often be there in the middle of the night working too. And, and I worked on the tiger faces for weeks, how I was going to design the tiger faces. And one day I said, Stephanie, come over and look, I want to show you. And the look on her face made me new. She was like, you know, you can, you can tell when someone sees something. You got it. You got it, right? And then, and then I re had read this article of this guy who had interviewed Mabel Stark when she was really old. And his wife, the interviewer's wife, said, she's starting to look like one of her tigers. And I thought, aha, Mabel has to look like a tiger. So Mabel had this kind of kinky hair and wore old lady black shoes, the kind old ladies used to wear. And um, so I, the outline of Mabel's hair, head, is the same as the outline of the tiger. So, oh yeah, oh yeah, they're in the front, they're in the window there. Um, and then it was like, just little things, like how do you, well, there was a show at the Crafton Folk Art Museum on Show and Hut. The Ackermans actually own that collection. And there was, a, there was a sign that said, no photographs. So Gregory said, I'll draw them for you. <laughs> so so, so that, was, that was one of the inspirations, was the Schoenhut Circus, which was a small, small, articulated, y you know, you can move their heads and everything. They had circus sets and zoo sets and African sets. And they had chairs and ladders and things like that. 
So that became a big influence on the design of it. Uh, the, the circus wagon is from there and some of the little stools. Um, then I started thinking, what if you were a kid and you went to sleep and you had this show and head collection and you had been playing with these little toys and you went to sleep and you started dreaming and your little toys were as big as you were. And so then I decided Mabel and her striped cats and the cats would be like cats and jammer kids, sort of. And they would be striped, tigers or striped cats. So I consider the circus to be the ultimate of what I've done. It took, I think, three years. Um, do you have some specific questions about how it's put together or the woods or anything or? We have it. We have it. McDonald's wanted the space to put a plastic hamburger and plastic french fries. <laughs> so they called us up and said, would you like it back? And we said, sure. So we have the circus back, and that's part of where I'm headed and part of the vision is we have this full-blown project that I would like to place somewhere. And it's got all of the research and all of the paper plans. And it's got t-shirts and totes and you know merchandise. And it can go to a museum or it can go to perhaps someplace like the Annenberg Pet Space, who is all about people relating to animals. Um, so that's what's up next for me, is to really try to put this together as a package and see the Annenberg Pet Space is all about finding forever homes for animals, and I have animals that I have to find a forever home for. <laughs> and I want it to be a good home. Mm -hmm. So after that playground, I was burnt out, and I wanted something simple. Please let me make something simple. So um, there was a woman who's from Craft and Folk Art Museum whose parents traveled a lot, and they were going to have a seminal Indian fabric skirt sale. So I went over there, and just like the Hani Haniwa horse, I saw this Navajo textile on the wall of Yebichi dolls. And again, out of body experience, like if I was a Navajo, I would be making those. Only I'd be making them in wood. And then I realized that that the, that the sand painting textiles were from the sand paintings. And the sand paintings were done for the tourists. And the, and the rugs were done for the tourists. And I decided that it was okay for me to inhabit that Navajo thing. I went back from this, this I bought some Seminole stuff. Let me see Lulu. One of my influences has been Rick Rack. <laughs> this is my, my four-year-old doll. I love zigzag patterns, and I love rickrack. So the seminal fabric was all rickrack, and the dolls on the rug had rickrack, rickrack stuff on it. So I started making the yay dolls. When I got back to the studio, I had all these scraps in boxes, and I pulled out, you know, like 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 just two by two by eighteen pieces of ebony, and I had the dowels. They're from a musical instrument place. And I literally laid out like this whole um, tribe in a day. And then I had some big ebony, so I laid them out big, and they became man icons, which Bergdorf Goodman bought and Neiman Marcus bought. And the whole idea about the man icons was that people with textile collections or fashion people could either display their kimono instead of behind plexiglass or on a pole, that they could take them on and off these man icons, or if you were a true fashion person, you could bring your stuff home from Neiman Marcus and you could hang it on it. You could lay out your shoes. It became like this fetish of yourself that you could look and go, oh, am I gonna wear that jacket? Am I gonna put that? Um, 
Um, so recently, I've been introduced to Frederick Froebel, and he's the guy that, inter that invented the term kindergarten. And his whole thing was about blocks and building blocks. And when I learned that his three of his early students, kindergartners that learned from Froebel, were Frank Lloyd Wright, Bucky Fuller, and Charles Eames, I was kind of blown away. I thought, whoa, because I have all these scraps in the wood shop. And so what's been happening in the, the process that's been happening in conjunction with this show is this ever-expanding process of what I've got and what it is and discovering what it is. And being in that, again, an out-of-body experience where wherever he was when he thought about kindergarten is where I am. And knowing stuff that, that you don't learn but that's intuitive and following whatever is in front of you and trusting yourself enough to go with it and when the hair on your arm stands up, don't question it. I used to think, well, I'm not sure. Let me vote on that, you know? Now it's like, uh-uh, I'm doing it. This is going to be on wheels, you know? Yes, question. How long does it take? When I was 20 and had a deadline, I could make one in a month. Now that I'm 74, takes a long time, only Martine helps me, you know? So if I were to have an order from the billionaire tech companies that are called unicorn companies, um, we could get it together to make a group of them, and I don't know how long it would take. It depends on how many days Martine was available. <laughs> I don't know, to make one? Well, you see, it's easier to make 12 than it is to make one. There's a lot of setup. There's a lot of measuring and setting up. And you set it up and you cut, then you gotta measure and mark and set up again. But if you're making 12 of them, you can cut 12 times. And that's why I've always loved, like the, like the next little dolls in there, I decided to make 144, 12 of each style. And all the other students thought I was crazy. But it's like, especially when you're working little, it's too hard to cut one of something. So, you know, we're going to do a, an open studio tour on November the 10th, and it's going to be part B of today. You're going to see more process. You're going to see stuff that's been happening since I've been putting this together. Um, there's other things that will be for sale there. I'm going to do a talk in the wood shop, show you how things are put together. And um, I invite you all to come to that. It's on a Saturday, and it's from 1 to 4, November 10th. And I think I'll be talking at 2. <laughs>